Mental training is defined quite simply as anything you do to keep your mind sharp, focused, and helping you move towards your goals. The main trouble with the idea of mental training is that a lot of people feel like it's adding another element of things to do. And yeah, okay, it may grow your mental strength, but you have to choose specific exercises. You have to think about what levels and plateaus that you're going to come across and how to burst through those plateaus and so forth. But the cool thing is, is that there are specific exercises that you can do. They're a lot of fun, but you can also get mental training just by changing how you think about the things that you're already doing. So we'll talk about that in a minute. And to help you figure out everything related to mental training, let's think about some of the different experts, what they've had to say about it. And if you're interested in everything related to improving your mind with a specific focus on training your memory, hit that thumbs up. Get subscribed if you aren't already and visit me at magneticmemorymethod.com for more free resources that are only available on the mothership of my website. Now first, to get into what this idea of mental training is, let's look at Dr. Carol Dweck. So she measures mental strength in terms of mindset and she gives a number of ideas of how to use different ideas to train your mind in order to have a stronger mindset. And she distinguishes between having a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. And of course, if your mindset is fixed, the trick is, how are you going to get yourself to be open to mental training that will help you grow or transform to experience, you know, what they sometimes call rewiring the brain, which is absolutely possible. And so she suggests hard work, dedication, and training your mind will all help on their own. They're a good unto themselves. And I agree, but this suggestion doesn't suit all people. I mean, it has several stages of learning that you need to go through. You got to put some thought into exactly where you're going to start. And again, if you have this fixed mindset, it can be frustrating because you are fixed. Nonetheless, her book Mindset contains powerful suggestions such as giving yourself a kind of CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy. So one of the things that she suggested is something I've had to do in order to move forward in life, and that's to not call yourself stupid. Rather, she advocates replacing negative thoughts with positive ones. And, you know, I used to ridicule myself a lot until I learned the self-inquiry questions that I shared in my TEDx talk. If you haven't seen that, you might find it very, very useful and helpful. It's how I ultimately made good on these suggestions from Carol Dweck. The next person who can help us understand mental training and how to get into it is Dr. Anders Ericsson. He's been attributed with developing the concept of deliberate practice. And although he may have coined that term, musicians have been using this form of practice for centuries. What is deliberate practice? Well, it is essentially having a feedback loop that gives you data on what you're doing and how you're doing it. And that the quality of that feedback loop comes from basically how consistent you are and the amount of tracking that you're doing and often having a teacher or a coach to help you with that. And this has been scientifically demonstrated in many ways in terms of getting mastery in any given field. And he's definitely right that you need continuous practice. You need some form of journaling or external feedback, but ideally both in order to achieve peak performance. You know, one of the most impressive memory athletes, Johannes Malo, he has shared how journaling has been a key part of how he trained his mind to improve in memory competitions over the years. And also he has the external feedback of many, many other memory competitors who are either giving him a run for his money or just sharing how that they weren't able to do as well as he's doing. So you don't necessarily have to have some sort of 10,000 hour rule, but some kind of deliberate practice that has a feedback loop and ideally several forms of feedback will give you mental training. And it is very, very powerful. Another person I want to mention is Dr. Richard Davidson. Dr. Davidson has conducted impressive research on the brain to teach us about how it's affected by meditation and mindfulness practices. So similar to Dr. Dweck, he has found that simply starting the practice of meditation is a good unto itself. Now, meditation often makes mental training easier to perform because it increases well-being and resilience just by learning how to sit and pay attention to the breath as an opening gambit. 
After a short while, you probably won't have to force yourself to do it. You may even find yourself attracted to doing it. And I've reported similar experiences in my book, The Victorious Mind, and shared some of the more substantial concentration meditations that you can try other than sitting just to sit and paying attention to the breath. I did that for a long time. It was really, really helpful, but things really took on the next level when I added more challenging mental training exercises. One of them, very briefly, is number skipping. And number skipping is literally breathing in and counting from one to 10, which is very difficult to do if your mind is not trained. But once you can do that, then you try to count from one to 10, but you suppress thinking about certain numbers. So this is kind of abstract. You got to play around with it in order to even understand it. It took me a while, but think of it like this. There's often this little mental puzzle. Don't think of a red cat. It's very, very difficult to process that command without thinking about the thing you're not supposed to think about. And that's what number skipping is. You think about one as you breathe in, you think about one as you breathe out, and then you don't think about two in the space for two. And this is where the challenge comes in, the mental training comes in. As you're trying to not represent two, what are you doing in order to not think about two in order to not represent it? Very, very powerful mental training exercise. Another person to mention here is Dr. Martin Seligman. Dr. Seligman has studied both the bright side and the dark sides of mental training. For example, he studied learned helplessness. Now, before I used mental training to heal one of my many mental problems that I've dealt with in my life, I had a high place phenomenon problem, which means I got really, really uncomfortable around high places. And I had what Edgar Allan Poe called the imp of the perverse. Don't want to get too much into detail about that, but it was very, very distressing. And the way that learned helplessness came into this is I would constantly repeat my own fears, but then I would also tell all my friends and other people about my fears of high places, and I would train them to help me steer clear of bridges when really what I needed was some sort of exposure therapy to those high places so I could deal with the imp of the perverse. It wasn't until that I learned of things like learned helplessness that I started to use mental training in a much more focused way to get much better results. And, you know, it's very, very powerful to be free of the learned helplessness that I participated in creating for myself and used to train others. And there's the bright side of it all, which is things like learned optimism to cultivate a more positive attitude and enjoy more resilience in the face of challenges. This has been extremely helpful for me because I'm more of a critical type person, a little bit sour often <laughs> and very, very skeptical. And I have to go out of my way to follow the bright side. And the good news is, is you can train yourself to do it. Now, I want to mention also Dr. Angela Duckworth. She has talked a lot about the concept of grit. This is definitely something we can all use, especially those of us who need perseverance and passion in order to achieve our long-term goals. Because let's face it, anything worth doing is going to take a while and it's probably going to require grit, mental strength. Dr. Duckworth has suggested that grit is a better predictor of success than IQ inborn talent, or any level of natural skill or ability. And if you've seen my video about IQ, you know that I would agree with this because I think that we can really think about IQ in many, many different ways. And if we're going to increase it, we can increase it by just changing how we define it. And then that can give us more grit to keep moving forward. Kind of a weird idea, I know, but it's definitely helped me. Now, in terms of the theme of developing grit through hard work and resilience, all of this stuff about having a growth mindset also runs throughout her work. And we need to think about how can we really get into this? Well, now let me give you some suggested mental training exercises. The first thing that I would suggest is brain exercise. There are so many ways to exercise your brain. You can practice memory related brain exercises, play memory games. There's different brain exercises that I've come up with for you on this channel. Everything from the field to the painting to using a metronome in a particular way. All of these resources are on the Magnetic Mary Method channel and magneticmarymethod.com forward slash brain dash exercises. You can also ask philosophical questions for brain exercise, and this will help develop your critical thinking skills and 
you know, all of this leads to basically neuroplastic changes in the brain when you engage in daily warm-up exercises. You can do neurobics, for example. A simple example of neurobics is not always following the same path. So it's kind of weird and people might look at you funny, but if you always walk past the mailbox, go around the mailbox in a circle or some sort of power pole or whatever. This will break your routine and it helps change the way that your brain works. It changes the, the plasticity of the brain. Very, very interesting. You can also, you know, brush your teeth with your non-dominant hand. Many, many exercises like this. They will provide mental stimulation and they will go to changing your brain, which opens up your ability to observe the world in different ways, literally because you've changed your brain. Now, I've mentioned meditation, and a specific way to think about meditation is memory-based meditation. So let's kick things up a notch from the number skipping exercise and think about memorizing long-form content. Now, there's a couple of long-form content things that I have memorized from the Sanskrit tradition, and I am personally memorizing also the Lojong phrases to create more mental peace, more than I've already got. These are great reminders to keep practicing these kinds of traditions. And because of the memorization component and the recall component, it gives you a very concrete experience of a mindset that will create grit for you. It will create mental strength for you. So one of the Lojong says, for example, if you can practice even when distracted, you are well trained. And that's an ideal that I strive for because I am often distracted. The weather sometimes distracts me, for example, but I still need to show up and practice. So memorizing some kind of long form content. I like to use a memory palace. I recommend that you do. That's what I teach in the Magnetic Memory Method Masterclass. And then you recall the information using the memory palace, and this will help you avoid distraction. It also is useful for improving negative attitudes, something that I've certainly needed at one point in my life. So one of my favorite Sanskrit pieces, it's part of a very long piece of Sanskrit that's called the Ribhu Gita, and it's an extract from the Ribhu Gita. It says that a real thought is as rare as a rabbit with horns. And whenever I think of that, I think of it in Sanskrit, it makes me laugh. And I use that as a mantra whenever I'm having thoughts that I don't want that make me uncomfortable or, or just a distraction. And then I can get back into things because I'm often distracted by a lot of just mental garbage. But due to mental training, and one of these things that it does is it creates a procedure using procedural memory is that all of a sudden this idea of a rabbit with horns comes back and I remember these thoughts aren't real. What's real is here, the present moment. And then I get deep into it. So thumbs up for that. Now, another mental training exercise that I find really useful is to be continually memorizing vocabulary. And you might be thinking, what the heck does memorizing vocabulary have to do with mental training? Well, it has a lot to do with it. For one thing, having a bigger vocabulary helps you read faster. Reading is itself mental training. And when you can read and recognize words, well, then you're more deeply engaged in the reading. You don't have to stop and look things up. And this gives you a lot more interest in life. So in order to memorize vocabulary at a much higher level, I would suggest getting involved in one of my programs like the upcoming Language of Memory program. You can get information about that at magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash L-O-M. And Another thing that you can do is spend at least 30 minutes a day memorizing vocabulary and phrases, either in your own language or in another language. And do it using your hands, using your mind, without using any sort of spaced repetition apps. A lot of people out there are weakening their minds and they're creating digital amnesia by either endlessly scrolling through social media online or just constantly repeating information through rote learning by exposing themselves over and over and over again to the same thing without creatively engaging with it. So, you know, just about everything you see online is designed to be lightweight and not exercise your mind. And this is really reducing our critical thinking globally. This is my opinion, but I think we see it in some of the science. Some scientists are saying that the Flynn effect is going down. In other words, there was a rise in global IQ levels, and these are now going down. Interesting. So one of the things that you can do to constantly be training your mind, constantly challenging yourself, is carrying a physical book, whether it's 
fiction, nonfiction, anything that you're interested in is going to give you much more mental exercise. The more you spend with print and you stick with print, the more you're going to extend your attention span. You know, a lot of us, we are trained to just hunt and gather, hunt and gather. So we find something that we don't understand, we look it up. I suggest that you use a journal while you're reading or index cards and anything you want to look up, save for later because that's going to keep your attention span focused on the book in your hands and you can always go and set a designated hour for research online and then make another list with your hand which is going to mentally train your haptic memory in order to get more recall of what it was that you found interesting enough in the book to research. And, you know, don't worry if you don't understand everything as you're reading. I actually go out of my way to choose books that I won't understand, and challenge is the only way to get the mental fitness that I seek. So, this is a learning cycle. To read something that's difficult to understand, take notes, ask questions as I go, and look it up later. This extends focus and it's very, very powerful. Now, another thing that you can do to do some mental training is things like yoga, qigong, tai chi, etc. These give you another way of looking at your mind, which is focusing and concentrating on completing moves. Now, I have talked a little bit about memorizing choreography on my blog, and you know, it's, it's, it's quite simple. If you can project mentally the moves on a memory palace or just project them on your body, start practicing them. And when you, oh, I can't remember what move is next, try to think of that as an opportunity to use memory techniques to encode what that would be like, either on your body or with reference to a figure in a memory palace. And then as you practice, you'll be able to make those moves with greater fluidity. It's a bit of a challenge, but that's the point. It trains your mind. Another thing that I would suggest that you do is spend some time practicing what is sometimes called multiple mentality. One of the hardest courses that I've ever engaged with is Harry Kinney's Multiple Mentality. Now, I first heard of him from a performer and a magic historian named Ricky Jay in his book, Learned Pigs and Fireproof Women. <laughs> How's that for a strange and intriguing title? Well, the basic idea of mental mentality is that you play various games with the alphabet in your mind, such as learning to recite the alphabet backward and reciting it out of order. So instead of saying A, B, C, D, E, it's A, C, E, and so forth, and you go all the way through the alphabet, and then you go back through the letters that you missed. It sounds silly, but it's quite a challenge, and it provides a lot of focus and clarity just by trying to recite the alphabet backwards and out of order. And from there, Harry Kinney has exercises for how to write backward, and develop something like ambidextrousness, so you write two things with both hands, and it's just really a huge challenge. So get into that. Now the ultimate is memory training itself, and this involves committing information to memory using memory techniques. One of the most important memory techniques of all is called the memory palace, and I invite you to get the free memory improvement course at magneticmerrymethod.com. It's gonna teach you how to use a memory palace technique, Basically, in order to memorize something from Sanskrit, I just create mental associations in space on walls and then I refer to them. So if it's Chittameva Mahadosham, there's an image of Chet from the Hardy Boys and there's Eva Perone, there's uh, you know the, the Chinese character from Ma and then there's Homer Simpson going do with a chamois on a car. And you know, you have to really get into that yourself, but this level of association gives you the sound and the meaning when you learn how to do it. So I got one more tip for you, but before I get to that, thank you for watching. Thanks for being part of this. Thanks for caring about your mind and being one of those individuals who wants to be part of a better world by focusing on being a better self. Are you ready to put some of these suggestions into action? I hope so, because as we all know, we need a lot more people in this world who are seeking the experience of a finer mind. Thanks as always for your thumbs up. Thanks for being subscribed. And listen, here's one thing that is very, very important. It is to keep coming at it. It is a form of mental training itself. When you fall off the horse, come back at getting on the horse. Stop 
stopping. That's one of my favorite mantras. Believe me, I am discouraged every day if I allow myself to be, but I constantly remind myself of this mantra. Stop stopping. It is an incredible tip. And one of the things that helps me is to ask something that I learned from Advaita Vedanta, which is related to all of my Sanskrit adventures. And that is to ask, who is it that I think wants to stop in the first place? Where is this person? Where can I find the I that I think that I am? Where does this notion that I have an I that wants to stop come from? This is a very abstract mental training exercise. It's called self-inquiry. It's one of my favorite topics in memory. I talk about it in The Victorious Mind. There are so many wonderful, wonderful additional questions to ask in a book called Evolving Beyond Thought that will give you a lot of mental training exercises that are along these lines. But even with that, the number one thing that I can say is stop stopping. The practice of getting back on that horse when you do stop, which is inevitable, is probably the best memory training exercise I know. And I'm so glad that I learned how to stop stopping. And I can't wait to hear what happens for you when you stop stopping too. Now, I mentioned there's a way that you can get mental training based on everything that you're already doing in your daily activities without adding anything new. Here's something very, very powerful. It's based on what's called sometimes framing effects. It may be related to placebo effect, and that suggests that this might not work for you, but it's well worth exploring anyway. I use this quite a bit. And the idea is, is that you use some sort of mental model, mental metaphor, or an image that you place in your mind before engaging in certain activities. So one study that I read years ago involved hotel workers who clean rooms in hotels. Half of the group in this study were told, well, almost nothing, just that their calories were going to be tracked as they went about their days working in hotels. The other half in the study group were told that if they think about the work that they're doing as exercise, they would burn more calories. And lo and behold, that group did burn more calories. Amazing. That's a framing effect. A more recent study from Duke University shows something about mental training for memory that's very, very fascinating, but something I know very well, which is that half of a study group went into an art gallery and their memory was tested. The other half of the study group was told to use the mental metaphor that they were art thieves and they needed to think about and plan how they were going to steal the art. Well, lo and behold, the people who pretended to be art thieves, they remembered more about where paintings were in the gallery and other details of those paintings. So they were getting mental training because they took on a mental metaphor. And this is what I do in my work all day long. It's what you can do in order to get mental training benefits if perhaps that you are able to experience framing effects, placebo effects, etc. Which is just simply to take on the mental metaphor that everything you're doing is mental exercise. The reality is, is that it probably is mental exercise, but because you don't think of it that way, you're not as engaged in it as you could be. So, Every time you're learning something, it's memory exercise. Every time that you are writing something, you're doing writing exercise that works your vocabulary and on and on and on. And it can be a bit of a trick to come up with mental metaphors all the time, but coming up with mental metaphors is itself another form of mental training. So it can be mental training all the way down, provided that you're willing to experiment with thinking of it, whatever it is that you do as itself mental training.